Welcome everyone to another episode of the Terrain Studio. I'm your host, Sean Morris. On this month's Terrain Tutorial, we're going to be working on some scenic bases. The first of the scenic bases that we're going to be working on are going to be in a winter biome. So you guys know that I love winter and I love doing uh, the ice and the snow effects. Uh, so we're going to have a little bit of a bigger platform to work with here. Um, and then on this project, what we're going to do is we're going to really build it up um, as a as a sort of a mini diorama and it's actually going to be used for a Star Wars Legion figure in particular the AAT uh, main battle tank and so what I'm gonna do first is I'm working with the existing uh, Legion uh, base and it's approximately six inches around it's about uh, I think it's um 15 centimeters in particular and so what I have here is a roughly a uh, six inch base and, and it's as you can see it's basically the size of this uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna set this aside and we're gonna use this as our template and for this I'm just using quarter inch cork uh, I'm going to uh, set the piece here and what I'm gonna do is just set the round on here uh, we're gonna use a marker we're gonna trace out um, the uh, the perimeter of this uh, and then we're just gonna use a knife to just crudely cut that out um, as you can see here we do need to do some notch bases and we'll do that after so we'll cut in a full circle um, if you want to layer up your your cork to be a little bit higher uh, you can always add secondary layers to this um, for this tank you're gonna see that I need to keep it relatively flat although I do want to build up some depth because that will allow us to cut in some uh, surface level features uh, even within this very thin or oh, um, cork bed so I'm just gonna set this aside as I said we're gonna go here we're gonna just crudely trace around There we go, and then hopefully that gave us a little bit of a mark. It's pretty faint. In fact, I'm gonna maybe give that a second, second go around here. It's a little hard to uh, to mark off on cork. That's fine. We just need a rough, a rough circle. There we go. All right, so once we have that, as I said, we're gonna take our knife and we're going to just start cutting out uh, the circle. Uh, once we have that, then we're gonna start cutting into shape. Um, so I won't do this whole thing on camera here for you, but what I like to do is I like to just take my knife and I like to score uh, my line going around. Um, and the reason I like to do that is I just wanna make sure that uh, I have a, a line to follow as I subsequently go around the next, the next go around. So if I come over here, so I can keep my hands and focus for you. So I just go around and score the edge. Then what I'm gonna do is go around with a little bit of a deeper cut. It's not gonna give me a nice smooth edge, and in fact, I don't want it to. And anywhere that is overly smooth, we're gonna muck that up anyway. So let's come back in a second. We'll have a look at that, and, uh, and then we'll get on with the next step. All right, so now we're back here in the studio with uh, a couple of the cork blanks cut. Uh, for purposes of this, uh, build and I'm also doing another one simultaneously. I thought I'd do a couple different designs. So um, one of them I'm going to do kind of a two layer sort of uh, water feature. Um, and on this one here, I thought I would do uh, sort of a more flat layer with perhaps a little bit of a build up or a rise built on the back side. Uh, so for purposes of this build, I will have to have a couple considerations. Um, one, the model orientation for for. Uh, this particular project, the tank is going to be oriented in this direction um, with a relatively flat front um, and a raised back, meaning I have a little bit of room to work here in the back. So when I'm planning out this base, I want to keep that in mind. I want to obviously build features where I'm going to be able to see them. And I need to make sure that I'm also adhering to the, uh, the logistics of the model itself. Um, so as I said, it's very, very flat in the front. So. So for purposes of this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use two uh, circles, and you guys can see I've just cut these out uh, relatively crude. They're both a little bit larger uh, than the base that I'm working with, and that's purposely done uh, to give me a little bit of room to sort of shape and carve uh, a little later. So when I'm doing this, it's going to be a little bit uh, messy. So you want to make sure that you uh, have a proper work area. Here I have a mat. It's going to get a little bit of splotches and splashes on it. That's fine. Um, but uh, for purposes of this, working with the cork, just keep in mind it is a little flaky. This stage, not so much, but the next stage, definitely. So that's something that you want to take into consideration while you're working. Um, another thing that you want to do is before you start hacking and carving is to draw yourself in a little bit of a, a, little bit of a sketch. So for purposes of this, I'm going to leave this 
one flat. I'm not really going to touch this bottom surface. Um, but this back layer, um, what I'm going to, or the top layer rather, um, is definitely going to uh, have a raised back and a flat front. So immediately what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to hack off a good portion of this. Another thing too I should point out, um, there's actually a central peg that's going to go right here, kind of located about there. And that's actually what's going to hold this sort of uh, repulsor vehicle, this floating vehicle. Um, so I want to keep in mind that I need to leave a little bit of room for that. We'll cut that in later so that won't be uh, so much of a consideration now. However, um, we do want to make sure um, that that's always in mind when we're looking at these features. So immediately I'm going to just go ahead and hack this line uh, off. And so what I'm going to do is just run my blade along it very crudely. And then I'm just going to use a little bit of a flex and set that aside. So just keep you oriented to this. Here we go. There's the front and that's going to be my rough backside with a little bit of a raised um, area. So that's fine. Everything's good uh, there. Now what I want to do is I want to artificially build up a little bit more uh, over here. So I'm just going to take this and I'm just going to cut myself a small raised piece. And for that, I'm just going to go ahead and just crudely hack another section. So again, just making sure I have this somewhat oriented correctly. There we go. I'm going to build a little bit of rise. We're also going to use some gamers grass uh, basing bits. It's a new product that they have. Uh, so we're going to incorporate that into our build as well. So here I have a sort of a three, sta a three stage um, base. Very, very crude. We'll do some definite um, shaping and uh, sort of cut in some features uh, here in the next step. But before we can get to that, one of the things that I prefer to do is I actually like to um, glue my pieces to my base. Um, that just gives a little bit more stability when I'm carving and shaping uh, later. And so while doing that, I wanna make sure uh, that I have proper adherence um, with the cork. And how I've been achieving that lately is typically I use weld bond, you guys know that. Um, but for these, what I have discovered is that uh, I've been having real good success with this LePage contact cement. Um, this is a low odor version just to kind of keep the smells down here in studio. Um, but I really like it for a couple reasons. The water content significantly lower, uh, the dry times a little bit faster, and the contact time, the strength of the bond is actually achieved quicker. It's about the same strength as a well bond in the end. Um, however, I feel that you can get a, a stronger bond quicker. Um, and so for purposes of kind of speeding through tutorials, if you're looking to cut down on time of builds, um, this might be some uh, consideration to make. There's one other bonus feature of this. It also comes with a brush inside the cap. And so that's really nice uh, that you don't have to destroy a paintbrush or, or seemingly use another brush uh, that you might have available, or perhaps you don't have a brush available. Um, uh, this one just conveniently has it in the cap. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna glue, uh, apply the glue to this surface. I'm gonna apply the glue to the underside of this, which will stick here. Um, I'm also going to apply the glue to the underside of this, which will then adhere, and then to the underside of this, which will then adhere. So I'm just going to flip all those pieces over and then go ahead and uh, apply that, uh, that glue. I do my very best to kind of keep it off the mat. I did get a little drip on the earlier one, um, which I would like to try to avoid. Um, but you know what? After all, this is a, a terrain making studio um, and it's not a hospital, so we don't need to uh, keep it pristine try to but with me and the likelihood of that pretty low so I'm just going to kind of brush those out as well as best I can and again just pretty thin set that aside give that about there you go see already getting a mess mess on there um so give that about uh 20 minutes or so to uh to set up and when um you're applying it to the cork um you probably want to go a little bit less. So total working time on this is probably going to be about 10 minutes before I'm going to start adhering it. Um, it's going to tack up pretty quick. You can already see it sticks to my uh, to my fingers. It's going to tack up pretty quick. You can put that down and you can set that aside for a few hours. Um, ideally, it's going to be uh, stronger the longer you leave it. However, if you do need to start with the carving process, I think in a few hours time, uh, it should be more than uh, able to be carved. Uh, we're going to put it to the test and of course always with things if you can take more time do so um, for purposes of tutorials i try to speed through a little bit and uh, that way get it kind of done in a day or so 
Um, there will be certain stages of this, however, um, that you will need to uh, you will need to leave your your items uh, to dry. Uh, so if you have another side project to work on, I'm working on some painting some figs at the same time, uh, which is always a good practice, right? Um, the hardest thing to do is to leave stuff if it's the only thing you're working on. However, if you can distract yourself with other projects, um, it becomes infinitely easier to leave something because you just simply get distracted by something else. And that's my trick because I am really, really impatient when it comes to uh, building things. I want to see what it's going to look like, particularly when I'm doing the test. And I have a test project uh, or a test um, base going on right now it's really nearly uh, complete and I'll start bringing that in in the uh, in the subsequent stages just to kind of give you a little bit more direction on where we're going so so here we do uh, we're here we have it we have it set aside we're gonna leave that about 10 15 minutes as I said we're gonna pancake that on there this on there and this on there um, then we're gonna set that aside leave that to dry a few hours come back with a really messy piece um, and kind of the nice feature about this um, build is that it really only has about one messy stage. And then after that, it's really all about uh, inks, washes, um, and, and paints, truthfully. Uh, if you don't have an airbrush, that's okay. You don't really need to airbrush a lot on here. I am going to airbrush, but everything that I'm going to do with an airbrush, you could simply do uh, with a brush as well or a dry brush. Um, and you'll achieve the exact same uh, results. We'll use a little bit of water effects on one of these. One of them we'll leave without, so you don't have to worry about if you uh, don't have that. We're gonna use our cool snow mixture, and I'll tell you guys again that formula if you don't uh, know how to make that up. And then we're gonna put it all together. We're gonna to, uh, slap a model onto it, and in the end, uh, I think you're really gonna like it. Okay, so we've had an opportunity to let the cork uh, dry. And just while I was off camera, I grabbed a few things. So first and foremost, we have the model that we're kind of featuring this base for. So it's an AAT uh, for, from the Droid Federation uh, for Star Wars Legion. So we're going to go ahead and set that aside. That's just for purposes of um, helping you logistically understand uh, what exactly we're trying to achieve in this particular build. Obviously, you want to have your model or at least a, a sense of the model that you want to use before you go designing your base. Now, with this particular model here, um, as I said, there's a there's a central peg, and I've gone ahead and positioned um, the peg uh, just by marking off the center and then offsetting it a little bit. If I were to orient this correctly, it would look something like this. And so you can see that the model hangs off the back. We have a little bit of room here to work feature-wise, and then the model itself um, is able to be positioned more near the front. So we don't have a lot of room underneath the work, but we certainly have this backside, and we'll be taking that into consideration. Um, so for the purpose of this, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we get good adherence. I don't really want the plastic to, to adhere to the uh, cork, but I do want the plastic to adhere to the underside. So I'm just going to simply go ahead and uh, cut that out and I uh, will work on camera here for this. So again, just uh, just cutting around here. And some people may ask like, why didn't you cut out the circle like before you glued it down? And, and that's a good uh, point, uh, but there are some considerations to have. Um, as I said before, when you're cutting out things and then you have to reorient them um, and there's room for sort of a margin of uh, error or, or wiggle, um, then you can have a lot of like, uh, misalignment and, and that's kind of an issue so I'm gonna go ahead and peel this up um, and just sort of pry it off and and, and the contact cement uh, of course won't be fully adhere uh, cured underneath here um, which is fine uh, but you can definitely see that it uh, it has some strength and, and still doing some hold I'm just gonna go ahead and scrape out uh, the internal uh, section you also notice that I moved the mat here just because it is uh, quite a messy process and I want to make sure that I get um, less stuff on my um, display board or display mat. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and grab that model again just to do a loose uh, fit to see if I can get that down in there. Perfect. Looks great. As you can see here on the back side how little clearance uh, I have for that exact, uh, you, you know, that, that fit. I want to have this look like it's just hovering above the surface. We've achieved that by sinking uh, this model down a little bit. So I think that works for us. And to set that aside. Now, that's just one uh, part of this step. What we also want to do is we also start want to start shaping in some of this and, and cutting it a little bit more to, to size. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to flip it over and I'm just going to start scraping 
along this edge, and this is why it gets messy. I'm just going to start scraping along the edge, and I want to get the cork um, as close to the plastic as possible. You can have a little bit of overhang, a little bit of under, that's fine. When I come to these notches, I'm going to go ahead and just do myself a favor and just sort of cut um, in along those notches, score along the notches. And then I'm just going to go ahead and start breaking the, the cork. Um, and this may take a little bit of, uh, of sanding later, um, a little bit more precision work, but it comes away uh, quite nicely. If you have a, like a large overhang, like here I have quite a bit, I'm just going to go ahead and score along the edge. And then I'm just going to start just breaking it off. I'm just going to... This is not going to have any ad adhesive really uh, because I didn't glue um, much on the overhang. There we go. Just breaking that away. I'm doing it upside down uh, purposefully just to keep the um, just to keep the material uh, from flying around too much. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, doing it like that as well. Just flipping it over, you can really see that I got this really crude edge, and I have some exposed uh, blue plastic. That's perfectly fine. I actually, in fact, will go and uh, expose a little bit more um, as I'm working through this. So um, I'm just going to speed up the next portion, but I am going to continue the exact same process. So now what I want to do, uh, now that I have kind of the, the crude shape uh, sort of cut around the outside here, uh, just cutting into those notches a little bit more, just want to make sure that the, the tools will fit in those later for gaming purposes because ultimately, you know, uh, you don't want to detract uh, from the, the playability of this just because you're making a scenic base. Um, at the same time though, if you can hide some of the more, um, you know, I guess non-organic features of this base, um, that would be nice. So. A couple things we want to do now is we want to start profiling uh, some of this edge. We don't want to just have this bump up and then and then all flat surfaces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and I'm going to start cutting and shaving in uh, some more topography here. So you'll notice that I'm just running my knife through and I'm just uh, cutting away um, portions and then I'm using my knife and kind of prying up some of, some of the cork base. So basically what I did here was I just sort of created uh, a little bit of a, a, a low a low point, um, leaving this a little bit of a, of a rise and then uh, sloping uh, this a bit more. So I'm going to continue here. I don't want this real harsh step. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is just drag my knife along that edge to, uh, to knock it down. You can see why I consider this to be the, uh, the messy step. The step. So I'm just going to, again, I'm keeping my, uh, my center peg uh, kind of cleaned out again because it has a little bit of uh, adhesive there. Then uh, in the middle or along the edge, if you want, you can drive your knife in, splitting the cork, and then I'm just going to run it through. So I'm just running it through about halfway, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pry that up, Just letting the kind of the natural tears where the cork wants to tear. There you go. So again, just knock that edge down a little bit so it's a little bit more sloped. There we go. So we've really started to profile out this piece. We've got some really nice layers and, and some undulations in the surface. We've left that little high point there that we talked about before. Just gonna go ahead and just knock a little bit of that down. I don't want a lot of that. Just want a slight, slight rise. So very, very subtle, a uh, little bit of a bump. Uh, I'm gonna come around on this back side here and I'm gonna start first crudely taking off some pieces and then I'll refine them a little bit more with some slight cuts. There we go. So now we really have a nice 
uh, a nice hill. But I don't want this all to be flat either. So let's just say, for example, I wanted to cut a depression. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to angle my knife in. And I'm going to go right in the middle, just angling in, just using more of the tip. Just be careful when you're doing it, of course. Just going to angle in the tip. I'm going to cut this weird sort of depression um, out. There we go. Okay, now what I want to do is just use my fingernails and I'm just going to start peeling back some of this in between stuff. Just bear with me here for a second. I've got three cameras, so I'm not sure which one will pick it up, but we'll probably try to capture most of this. There we go. Just peeling that up, just prying it up a little bit. Almost. Some's deeper, some's lighter, or uh, some's more shallow, I should say. There we go. I've gone right down to the to the blue, the plastic, here in the middle, which is perfectly fine. I'm just going to scrape up this center portion here. Just trying to keep the small debris from adhering. I want my peg to sit flat. You can obviously sand that out after. Make sure I have all the stuff peeled up. Okay, so now what I've done is I've cut a depression right here in the in the middle. That's again just adding a little bit of uh, surface characteristics. And uh, lastly, what I want to do is I'm going to come along this edge, and I'm going to cut down this front edge quite a bit. I'm just going to run my again driving my knife uh, in, you know, about an eighth of an inch or or so along the front and then I'm just going to use my finger tips nails just to peel that uh, peel that up so now I've kind of split the difference and what I'm going to do is just run my knife on an angle this is sloping that back there we go really created a Nice surface. And then over here, I'm going to cut this right down to the base. So I'm going to remove just about all of the cork right there. And I just want to create a low point that I can add something in after. Okay. So now, again, just that final scrape here. So now we have a really interesting uh, base. We've uh, we've set the high point here. Uh, we've set a very low point here. We've set a variation amongst the uh, amongst the base itself. Um, we've obviously cut in the peg, and we have a lot going on here. We've really uh, broken the surface up. We once again, go over to our model and drop the model. It'd be kind of in alignment like uh, this. This is where we've set the front, and then you can really see here in the side camera that uh, we've set um, ourselves up to, to have a nice little profile in the front. we got a little bit of room to work underneath the, the front uh, spots in here. Um, and then on the back side, we've, uh, we've profiled really nicely with the line, uh, the outline rather, and then we have a little bit of a raised area. So we've got a lot of character um, in the base and we haven't really added any of the features other than um, just tearing up our, our base um, material. So, what we'll do is we'll get that a little bit of a clean. If you have a little bit of an air compressor or something like that, um, or a brush, a stiff brush, just go in and brush away uh, all the uh, the loose debris. Um, we'll glue the peg in um, before too long, uh, because then what we'll do is we'll use a little bit of the material to kind of hide and, and, and mix that in a little bit uh, nicer. Um, we do have lots more work to do on this, but we certainly have a much um, more interesting surface to work with um, than that relatively flat surface that we started with. So um, I'm going to get cleaned up here and we'll come back in the next step. Okay, so now we're back here uh, in the um, 
next stages, if you will, of the build. Um, I have set aside here just a, a gradient of, of the uh, terrain bases. Um, this one obviously being far more advanced than the others. Um, this is something that we're going to work up to achieve. Uh, obviously this has several layers of painting as well as some, some textured technical GW paint applied. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to walk you through all the steps so we will get there. Uh, the base that I worked on yesterday, I've actually advanced that a little bit. So I'm going to start off with uh, showing you a different base here to start. This is the small river base that I've done or stream base. Um, same sort of techniques been applied here uh, to stacking the cork uh, and then just cutting in the edges, much like the technique that's already been shown. Um, I was able to achieve quite a difference in uh, topography here from top to bottom and again that's just achieved by cutting through the uh, the layers at various angles um, and scraping it away. I've gone almost down to the plastic uh, here. I did want to leave some of the uh, cork to give me a nice interesting uh, stream bed. On the other side here I've just cut in some uh, small gradients uh, just to create a little bit of difference in elevation but this one's an overly uh, overall a, a much taller uh, base in terms of profile. Um, the gray base seen here is probably a medium and the one we're going to be working on is a very low base here uh, the flat being almost uh, level with the uh, with the plastic. I'm also going to talk about the three basing materials that we're going to use and we're going to apply that to all of them obviously um, and then we're going to use uh, technical paint in the next step and that's going to help us achieve uh, both a textured look as well as locking in. I'm also using Gamers Grass Rock Bits. Uh, this is a new product from Gamers Grass. Uh, these uh, resin bits are really interesting. They have a, a really cool look. Uh, I like the uh, non-uniform surfaces uh, because they allow to you uh, to really kind of fit them into your profile of the base. They don't have any hard edges that you need to kind of cover. So you can see here on the gray base, I've, I've basically blended those in. Uh, on, the minute, on the middle one here, I've shown you kind of what that medium stage looks like. So uh, I like using the gradient of the materials just because it gives you that degrading look um, as the rocks break from large to small. So uh, here you can see I'm using these really uh, angular bits. Uh, these are a decorative stone as opposed to something you'd find outside. Um, I like them because they're a good size and they have those really, like I said, really sharp edges um, and that really extends the look uh, of the large stone. So I just go ahead and place those generally uh, on the extent, uh, the exterior rather, uh, of those rock structures. And then I go ahead and uh, put them in sporadic places here and there. Here I'm using it to, uh, to cover the peg. Um, the next stage or the next material is going to be applying the um, more coarse gravel. Uh, this is just achieved by uh, shifting down uh, some sand. Um, that uh, sand is uh, generally available in a place and or uh, you can even buy gradients of sand in some uh, scenery or art supply stores. So um, really easy to apply. Uh, this goes down with scenic cement as opposed to super glue. And I generally start again just extending off those angular stones. And then I might put a few pieces here and there uh, just to create a little bit of a rougher uh, texture. Um, I like to use this sand to fill the cracks and the crevices uh, of the stone just so I don't have any huge gaping holes uh, or I don't have any areas that are going to uh, really soak in the inks and look a little bit weird um, as, we, as we progress forward. So really important that I kind of fill all the gaps in. Obviously uh, the best gap filler of all is your really fine sand. So I'm going to go ahead and apply that after um, the coarse sand as well. Again, using the Woodland Scenics Scenic Cement. It works really good for adherence. Um, sometimes adding a little dish soap helps you to uh, break the surface tension. You're going to notice that it pools a lot on the cork itself. Um, it doesn't uh, wick in very nicely. It will on other surfaces. However, I achieve that by uh, giving it a little bit of a swirl. So you'll notice that I will uh, pick up the base and sort of shift it around and move it around it just to get that scenic cement uh, flowing into the edges. Uh, this sand right here, obviously, it's a little bit finer, and so the adherence value of this is, is pretty low. It doesn't have a lot of surface area, and so you will need to uh, potentially saturate this twice. However, we're going to use the technical paints to really help us solidify the sand. And so as long as you have a proper adherence and you don't have a lot of flaking, uh, you should be perfectly fine to just use the technical paint to lock that in. Um, Paint is not the best ad adhesive, however it does, each subsequent paint layer uh, does help to lock that in um, as you move forward. So let's speed this up and uh, get going with the application.
So now we found an opportunity to give the base plate a uh, prime color. For this I've chose to use Tamiya Fine White. We're going to move on from this stage and give it one more prime color and for that we're going to use an Anthracite Grey. But I like the Tamiya Fine White because it gives the rim a nice uh, prime. It allows the Vallejo Model Air to go on a little bit easier. And also the powder finish does serve to highlight um, any of the low-lying areas as well as the high points. I'm able to see in the rock transitions here whether I have enough if I want to go ahead and add some more before I start progressing. And it just gives me an overall nice shade. It adds a little bit of contrast and I'm able to see where the sand and the grit uh, settled out. And just allows me to uh, make more informed decisions uh, whether I have enough surface texture added. It's an important step. It's a quick step. Um, it's a step that you could pretty much uh, eliminate if you felt comfortable um, in your application. But uh, like I said, it's something that serves to give you a lot of information um, and is relatively easy to apply. So we're now back with the base plate having been given the undercoat of anthracite gray. We're now going to apply the technical paint Astro Granite from Games Workshop. Um, this is a really cool product. It's very similar to the Vallejo um, Earth uh, line, the uh, either the Dark Earth or the uh, or the Natural Earth. Um, and so this uh, sort of acrylic paste goes on. It has a nice texture feel. I really like how this one goes, and I really like the coloration of this. Um, Vallejo does make a gray as well, uh, but I thought I'd give the GW uh, product a try, and uh, it stands up quite uh, nicely. So I'm going to do a little bit of this on camera. I'm not going to do the entirety of the process. Uh, because I already have the other base plate that's advanced. But nonetheless, we'll, we'll show you what we do here. It's very simplified. Uh, just take your brush, um, dip it in, get some of the, uh, the stuff on here. I wouldn't use your most um, favorite brush to do this process, but uh, you can uh, definitely use a brush. It's not gonna wreck it, but it is not going to make it uh, very fine pointed. So what I do is I put on a glob, get it all off on my brush, and then I just start moving it around. Now. You don't want to, I guess I should say, if you want to have some real um, definition in your texture, uh, then you don't want to push it around too much, or you don't want to push it around everywhere too much. So leaving some piles, uh, leaving some, some buildup um, is perfectly uh, fine. I kind of let it roll off the brush. I move it around. I definitely don't want to stretch it too thin. Um, and what I'm actually doing is I'm actually going over all the existing textures. So in that previous step where I was talking about uh, locking in the stone and, and, uh, and using the scenic cement, um, this truthfully just prevents you from pushing around in this process. Once this stuff's on here, uh, there's no getting at that texture. So it's going to be uh, quite nicely uh, protected. So as you can see, progress pretty quickly through this. And again, just using more of a roll technique. I'm not trying to... Uh, to push it around too much. I'm certainly not brushing it on. Um, that's that's quite important because if you do that, you're going to stretch it really, really thin. And although it may look like it's covered, you're just going to have some of the pigment rubbing off and not actually much of the texture build up. So it's quite important that you don't um, that you don't brush it too much. When I come around these existing rocks, I have two choices. I can go over um, the existing stones, or I can build up around them. So um, for these ones here, I'm just going to show you. I'm going to build up around uh, two of them, and then the other two. I'm just going to leave the exposed tops, and I'll kind of show you what that looks like. I'll rotate the base around here um, in one second. So again, you can see that rolling action that I'm using. So if I rotate the base around, you can just really see in here how I've, I've left uh, one of the stones exposed, just to kind of give it a little bit of definition. Obviously, I'll pick that out with a slightly different color. The primary areas of concern that I'm, I need to take some care into in covering um, is I don't want to cover the debris stones that we added, the gamer's grass debris. Um, the reason being is I, I want to have that sort of different texture. I want to have that more slate texture and, and I don't want to put any texturized paint. So um, I'm just going to, I'll go close in here and I'll kind of show you. So I just build up right to the base and here I sort of use a, a sort of 45 degree angle and just jam it into the base. I want to have the bottom not have a hard transition between the texture and the stone. I actually want a more natural look, maybe like the earth kind of coming up or maybe perhaps the rock is, is slowly been extruding from the ground. Um, so that's just something that I like to do is just kind of press that, uh, press that in. And again, the stippling technique is about as close as you're going to come to any sort of brush stroke. And that just basically um, ensures that you do get a little bit of adherence between the technical paint 
um, and the uh, and the surface. You don't want to have it just layered on there because you do want to have some adhesion. Um, when this stuff is dry, it's it's quite nice. It it does uh, provide a a very um, like I'd say a uniform surface, um, depending on how thin or thick you have it. Um, but it definitely creates a really interesting surface. That's for sure. Um, what I'm going to do for this one is I'm not going to press into the very base of the riverbed. I'm actually going to leave that a slightly different texture. I'm going to use the more uh, sand texture there, uh, but I am going to come right up close to the banks here. And here I want to actually, you're going to notice I'm going to do a little bit of brushing, not much, but I want to um, thin that just a little bit as I run it down into the riverbed. So I don't want to have a, a like a buildup, like a rise. So if my hands were the riverbed, I want to have it more of a flat transition. So riverbed and edge, as opposed to kind of like a, a glob like this. And then I'm going to have this weird sort of transition, um, with the, with the water coming in. So that's, uh, that's what I'm going to do there to give you a, con a context of coverage. Um, this bottle won't quite finish this one here however i have done two uh, and so one bottle doing the entirety of uh three six inch round surfaces is not bad for a bottle of paint uh especially something more in the in the technical range so it's more of a i'd say this is more of a terrain product than it is a, a paint product so and again just just getting it off my brush however that looks and i'm going to go back and stipple build it up and, and give it a nice uh, coverage. So I think you guys get the idea there. Obviously we'll continue through that, uh, paying close attention to not cover the debris here. In this case, you could cover the riverbed, it would be perfectly fine. Um, I just wanted to have a slight uh, difference in, uh, in texture here as I apply the water product after. Um, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. If you get to your edges, what I do is I brush it along and then I just take a cloth, a little damp cloth, and then clean up the edge right away. I don't want to have any texture on my outside around, um, but certainly I do want to have the texture drop right to the edge of the plastic base. So, so that's the technical, uh, pun intended, technical part of the build. Um, we're going to set that aside once we finish. We're going to come back and have a look at a dry one and show you what the next step is. Okay, so thanks to the magic of television, we've gone ahead and finished up the uh, the technical part, adding the uh, the technical paste. And uh, miraculously, the technical paste has actually shifted this to an entirely different base. Uh, I kid, this is really just the other one that's running in parallel to the stages. Just really helps me progress through the tutorials a bit quicker. Um, so we've gone ahead and switched back to the base that we had uh, previously carved at the start of the video. Um, this has now been given the technical... Um, coverage as I said this is actually the color that it dries up to so it goes on significantly lighter but it does give you a really nice um, I, I think a nice undertone uh, for anything in terms of a rock type world uh, or in this case uh, the snow world that we're going to do so I really do like the undertone of this however um, one thing that you're going to see versus when we put the white primer on is we really have a lack of definition there's really no discernible differences between the th four different types of textures that we've added at this point, five if you count the uh, the gamer's grass debris. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to give this entire, um, the entire base a really quick uh, shade. And for that I'm actually going to, again, stick with the GW line, I'm experimenting with that for you guys. And we're going to use, these words are, are crazy here, uh, Dra Drakenhof Nightshade, I think I have that correct. Um, nonetheless, don't judge me, here's the bottle. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to give the entirety of this uh, a coat, including the debris. Uh, I'm going to go right over top of those, add a little bit of shade. Primarily, I'm not worried about getting the top coated, but what I do want to do is get the recesses um, between the rocks where I don't have the technical paint added. I want to put it in there so that I can get some sort of uniformity of color, as well as it's going to give me a nice uh, look in the crevices. So again, this is a very uh, easy, easy step. Give this a shake, not that it would be uh, thick in any, any means, but just a natural habit of uh, shaking stuff before you start um, and what we're gonna do and this is really blue in color by the way I'm not sure if I can quite get that on camera but um, it's really quite uh, it's, it's kind of a striking blue to be quite honest um, the first time I put it down I was a little concerned um, again the blue undertones for snow are quite important it really helps you achieve that um, that cold feel um, I was a little concerned that it was a little too blue, um, but I think when we put it down and when it dries, you guys will be most impressed with the color. So again, not going to, uh, to bore you with the entirety of this process, um, but you're going to see 
um, just quickly how this how this works. We'll cut. We'll do some coverage, um, and then we'll obviously come back when it's all uh, dry. We'll actually come back with this particular base. Uh, we'll run this up through another series of segments, and then we're going to come back with a third base, um, which you guys have seen uh, briefly, and we're going to finish the snow on that. And then eventually I'll catch all these up to the same point. Um, and uh, next month I will share a finalized photo of what that looks like. Um, in the interest of getting this up for you guys, I probably won't have that ready in time. So again, just brushing this over the entirety uh, of the base. When you come to the rocks, no worries, just go right over top of those. So anywhere you have um, surface, I'm gonna leave the peg out. I'm not gonna brush the peg, but um, just start brushing that uh, over. And you're gonna notice that I will have some sections that will be a little bit thicker. Um, I'm gonna let it pool where it naturally pools. There's a little bit of a recess through here. You remember we put that in. So it's going to pool down in there and be a little bit uh, darker. Um, which is perfectly fine. We're going to come in um, later and uh, and add some dry brushing, and we can we can pay particular close attention to um, how we dry brush, uh, where exactly we apply the highlight layers, where we kind of leave the low lights in, and we'll achieve uh, all that um, with this with this uh, step here. You know, we're setting the stage for that that step, I should say. So, all right. So that's, that's effectively what we're going to do. We're going to brush over the entirety of this base. You guys can see how, how that's starting to look. It really has that blue blue undertone. We're going to change that significantly, but it is a nice, uh, nice starting space. Um, and, and don't fret if you're trying this out for the first time. And uh, like me, you're thinking, wow, uh, that is more of an alien world and less of a snow or rock type surface. But... Um, Trust with the magic here of, of drying and time. Um, it's gonna look uh, it's gonna look a lot nicer here as we progress forward. So I'm gonna continue on this, folks, and you guys are going to have the luxury of uh, seeing the next clip. All right, so we're now back with the base having applied the uh, dark shade, the blue shade or wash. Uh, you can see here from the overhead camera, it blends almost entirely perfect with this black um, base. Now the black matte itself is a true black and this is much more of a blue black. Um, we're going to significantly bring this base up from this point. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work under kind of close cam for you. I'm going to walk you through this progression of steps. Then I'm going to speed this entire clip up and you're going to see the progressive steps. I'll use the annotations at the bottom to let you know what color I'm using at which particular stage. But let me just kind of walk you through. It's going to actually be a five step process. Um, so if you guys haven't gathered at this point, this base is a pretty in-depth process. You can certainly add or subtract steps as you as you want, but I wanted to make it as comprehensive as possible just to kind of give you as many tools and tricks and techniques to apply in whatever fashion you see fit and I think you guys know that's kind of my style for tutorials so what we're gonna do first is we're gonna come in with a Vallejo air uh, the model air range and we're just gonna use gray it's just a color gray um, next the subsequent highlight layer is going to be you guessed it light gray I like the light gray gray combination I feel that there's enough contrast and pop between those I also use those on my droid bases just for the rocks so again anthracite then followed by a gray and then light gray I don't typically use the wash it just doesn't absorb as well into the cork um, but it does work well with the paste the next layer after that we're gonna switch back over to the GW range and we're gonna use long beard gray it's more of a white gray um, which subsequently I'm going to use after this. So this is a little bit thicker. I find that it dry brushes quite nicely. Um, also, I'm going to use this very strategically in some high points. And so I like to have that kind of thick uh, paint pigment on my brush just as I'm laying down those over highlights. Um, next up after that, I'm going to switch back and I'm going to go to an airbrush and then I'm going to actually airbrush on the white gray. I use this more as a frost layer, so I will really dust some areas, maybe rock surfaces. Um, if we have a water feature, we'll uh, often dust it with this as well. Um, and then in addition, um, if I'm going to use a water feature, I'll actually do something before that. Um, but for this step, I'm actually just going to go to the white gray. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some white wash in some other areas just to add a few more frost tones, but really seek, uh, sink down 
into the recesses of the um, of the rubble and of the debris, uh, whereas this white gray will sit more at the surface level um, and give a little bit more of a top coverage. So that's kind of the steps there. As I said, you can certainly add subtract. I would probably stick with at least a three color um, process here and you want to go something back to almost the original but a bit lighter um, and by doing that or what I'm using for that is the gray it's a little bit lighter than the anthracite so the anthracite will still in a combination with the wash will still create my lowest highlight here bringing it all the way up to the long beard white so as I said I'm gonna get started with this you guys are just along for the ride here enjoy the uh, sped up process um, I'm just using a simple dry brushing technique. I'm gonna heavily dry brush on the gray, heavily dry brush on the light gray, switch up to a little bit more of a light strategic dusting with the long beard white, a little bit of a strategic airbrush dusting with the white gray, and then of course, just a little bit of here and there as I see fit with the white wash. So a progressive highlight from, or a process of heavy to very, very light and strategic. Um, I think you guys know how to dry brush at this point. The technique's pretty uh, simplistic. You will see me doing it on camera. Um, I will, of course, only do a little bit of each color just to speed the process up. So let's check it out and we'll catch you guys on the other side of this clip. Okay, so we've once again switched bases, and I've just done this for the purposes of doing the final sort of stage of this build. Um, now, it's indifferent in which base I'm using. I wanted to use this one just because I had a little bit more of advancement um, in terms of the, the features already added, but the same dry brushing technique, the same cork cutting, the same uh, technical paint application um, was done to this one to get us to here. Uh, the water features laid in, and that's just using a combination of scenic um, scenic water effects as well as a little bit of white paint and water um, and we kind of get that swirled effect that real thin ice is not attempting to look like a pond or a stream that's just that real thin ice you know that sometimes forms over uh, low water features uh, in addition we've added a little art coat here onto the rocks just to give them a little bit of sheen and we're going to sort of spruce up that effect um, here in the next stage so this is actually a really fun part and, and probably what most of you are looking forward to in terrain making. A lot of the nuances of getting here are more the technical things. Um, they're more about uh, applications um, and techniques that aren't really going to be seen. However, they are going to accentuate and really truthfully show off the end result. So we're going to be adding all the panache in, in these next few steps. but. Truthfully, we didn't get here without those subsequent uh, earlier steps. So hopefully you guys have toiled through the tutorial um, and really tried to apply some of that stuff to, uh, to, to whatever build you're doing. So, um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run through a bit of the materials and talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the mixture and, and then talk about the application technique. So uh, for tools, we're going to use just a little bit of a popsicle stick or a, or a, a you know, tongue depressor, something thin I like, but something that you can scoop uh, some of the snow material with. I like to use a sculpting tool here. I have a little bit of a scoop on this end and then more of a flat trowel end here. A uh, small brush, again, not something that you're gonna be using to paint those Golden Demon award-winning models, um, but rather something that's uh, 
you know, medium size. And you'll see this one is really twirled into a rounded uh, tip. And that's because it's all the rolling applications that I do with this. You guys will notice that I roll a lot um, my brushes. And that's really to make sure that I take brush strokes out. And it really helps me control the pile mechanism of whatever I'm doing, either paste, uh, snow, or uh, something similar. Uh, so that's our, our brush that we're going to need. Um, for this, I'm going to be using uh, several Gamers Grass uh, Tufts. Uh, so I'm going to be using these ones, Wild Tufts. I just checked the product name of that Wild Tufts there. Uh, these are the new Tiny Tufts that I'm featuring. They sent these to me. Uh, this is beige. You can see how many of those Tufts are on there. It is insane. So we're going to use those as well. Um, then we have here some of the Spiky Winter Tufts. And I've used those before, certainly on my droid bases. They're a little del delicate to work with. And we'll have to get some tweezers, which I didn't grab, but I will. Um, and then we're also going to be using these. These are Wild Tufts again. They're going to tie in. In a little bit of that white look to that dead grass look and these are called winter tufts so uh, again just a nice range here um, of uh, kind of you know fall to to deep winter and this is going to be kind of our palette that we're going to mix and mingle amongst the bases Okay, so that we have. We've got a couple of droids here, of course. They have some character going on. There's a little bit of a narrative there. Uh, I have a dead dead droid or fallen droid here. We're going to cover him a lot in snow. Just have a few parts and pieces sticking through. Um, this guy here, just a standard you know, trooper moving along, uh, doing his thing. Uh, this guy here has lost his arm, and he's attempting to uh, hold it up in place. Um, and this one here has uh, decided to take the Captain Morgan pose um, and point in the direction that he'd like the tank to fire. But if you guys remember the tank, he has a guy kind of fumbling into the turret. And so that is not happening. So I like the narrative piece. And we're certainly going to use our snow effects to kind of add to that narrative as well. Um, so for the snow effect, it's my homebrew. There's a lot of snow products on the market, and I don't want to sound elitist when I say this, but none of them are as good as the mixture of multiple products together. Uh, I just haven't found something that goes on and looks as real and gives the sheen and the texture of snow as well as a combination of products. That being said, I am using Woodland Scenics Soft Flake Snow. I'm not sure if we're catching on overhead or close cam, but Soft Lake Snow Woodland Scenics. I'm also going to use some Scenic Cement. You guys know this. I use this by the liter. It's fantastic. This is actually half liter, but you know what I mean. Um, I use a lot of it. It's fantastic stuff. Um, it has a wicking agent. It really cuts through, helps penetrate, and, and get that snow uh, laying flat. Um, I also use some standard weld bond PVA thick stuff. I like this. Just adds a little bit of substantive um, nature to the snow. And helps us kind of to keep it um, more piled, I guess, in, in a sense. All that has been combined here in this uh, convenient baby food container. Um, but truthfully, uh, I just use this as a, as a container to hold it. But let me just show you the, uh, the mixture and the texture. So overhead, we'll catch that. And hopefully, we can get that on close cam as well. Um, you guys can just see the nature of that stuff really has a nice you know hold and real wet look um, it's going to rate retain that uh, that shine um, and still give us a little bit of texture we'll of course come back and accentuate uh, in the end with a little bit of soft lake snow directly and we'll apply that with the scenic cement so we're really going to use this the combination of these three um, to to achieve more or less two effects both our thick snow as well as our lightly fallen snow so to apply this um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start piling it on here. Um, I know the tank is going to take up a good portion of this, and so a lot of this front edge you're not going to see, um, but I am going to pile it on there. Of course, I want to leave my rocks exposed, as well as I want to leave um, some of the, the water feature exposed as well. Um, so again, I'm not going to do the whole thing for you on camera, but I am going to talk a little bit about the technique. So we're going to begin the process by applying a couple large globs or masses of the snow uh, effect. What we want to do here is we want to use these as kind of our central hubs and we're going to be spreading out the snow from here. Uh, so I recommend putting these down in an area where you are not afraid to have um, large accumulation. Um, here what I'm doing is I'm just setting some of the boundaries uh, around the water effect. Um, in other areas right at the back of the peg here I'm going to create a large flat space because I know that's going to be behind the tank. Um, the rest of the space is going to be relatively flat because it's going to be under the tank, but nonetheless, I want the base to have a real scenic appeal. I want the narrative to be decided by the application of the terrain materials and not by the models themselves. They'll lend to the narrative, but I don't want to dictate the narrative entirely based on them. 
just pressing a little bit here into the central peg as well, just to kind of manipulate and make that part of the, uh, the overall look. I want to press some against the dead droid body as well. As I mentioned, it's going to be largely buried. Recommend highly to having um, material underneath like a paper towel or cloth, something that's not going to be afraid to get dirty. You want to throw it out after and you want to make it somewhat absorbent just because you will have some of the snow or scenic cement running down off the base and onto the ground layer. Um, for this, uh, of course, I'm using some gamer's grass tufts as I illustrated before. I'm just going to get these out and I want to kind of uh, set a little bit of a pattern in terms of how I'm going to apply, where I'm going to apply, and sort of what combination I want to apply those in. Um, the spiky tufts are going to be the first ones that I put down. They're the largest ones. I want to use those um, to really determine the, the high points where the uh, vegetation may have been highest. And I'm, I'm going to put some of these underneath the tank, because or primarily near the back, because I want the tank to have a little bit of a flattening effect on them. And just to give the illusion that the repulsor moving over the ground is actually flattening some of the vegetation. So that's kind of important. So every little piece that you add is technically lending itself uh, to the narrative. You'll notice that I didn't apply any adhesive here. In fact, I'm actually using the adhesive nature of the snow effect itself to solidify and to hold in the vegetation. Pressing a little bit of snow or banking it against the base is also a nice way to just make sure that you have proper transition from both your vegetation um, to your snow and vice versa. Um, adding in these sort of fall or winter tufts, you'll notice that they're going to be a little bit stark in terms of contrast and we're going to take care of that look later. It won't be achieved here because I don't want to create a lot of piled snow on top of the tuft. That'll be an effect we'll use later but it'll be a little more subtle as opposed to the large uh, conglomer conglomerations that we're adding now. Um, adding in a little bit of the winter tufts here in between and you'll notice that I just applied a little bit of the snow effect to the bottom. This is another great technique if you're looking to extrude or press out and get good and proper adherence between your tuft and the base. Again you're using the base, uh, you're using rather the tufts on a very um, granulated or rough surface so getting flat adherence is going to be pretty tough. This is why I like using something with a little bit more substantive um, nature like the snow because it tends to grip and and sort of conform to the granular base here I'm using some of the mini tufts you'll notice how small these are using a tweezer to put them down um, they're really kind of a nice feathering type um, uh, product and so if you want to uh, break up the uniformity of the uh, the medium or regular size tufts you can really use these mini tufts to create sort of a transition into either a flatter space or perhaps even using them in tighter spaces where the larger ones will either have to be fold folded or cut um, here just kind of going back and and banking up the material around that droid again putting it underneath making it look like the droid has fallen maybe not in this battle but maybe in previous and the snow has had a chance to accumulate uh, over the droid body uh, we're going to use a few other techniques uh, upcoming just to kind of blend in the droids to make it look like they're not necessarily plunked from the sky directly into the snow but more have traveled through and perhaps have uh, have been in the snow for some time so we'll use some weathering techniques um, in the subsequent clips to take care of that. So I'm just going to let you guys kind of enjoy the process here. You'll notice that I'm just uh, using a variety of tools sort of to press and manipulate the snow. Um, this is generally the technique I use for this application all the time, whether either with trowel or brush, that rolling technique, flattening it out uh, and really manipulating the snow. The snow is going to have a natural slumping element to it as well. Uh, so whether you pile it really high or not, it is going to somewhat subside um, and flow out. So keep that in mind. Um, if you want more of a piled look, you may have to go back and do a second application. If you want more of a smooth glass look, um, it will achieve that well on its own. Okay, so now that the primary layer of snow has had an opportunity to dry, you can see that our base looks significantly different. I've gone ahead and added in more gamer's grass tufts, uh, whether they were the spiky tufts, whether they were the winter tufts seen here, um, or a combination of the, uh, the fall ones, both the regular size um, as well as the new uh, mini tufts. So I think we have a nice blend and combination. You're also going to notice here, just speaking to kind of the narrative of the piece, um, in the back regions here, I've done a bunch of uh, just sort of pock marks um, in the snow. And this is going to simulate the droid footprints kind of moving through um, the snow base. 
um, here at the back side of the tank that's going to be largely exposed. I've done a more flat sort of windblown uh, snow effect. And you can kind of see here, I have this large conglomeration. Here, obviously, where the water feature is, we've left a lot of that exposed. And then just a few exposed pieces in and around the rocks. But we have a couple pieces that we need to kind of work on. And it's nice to kind of put that primary layer down and then come back and revisit. Um, one, I may need to adjust or add a little bit of snow around some of the tufts. Maybe they didn't adhere. Maybe there's a little bit of a bit of an exposed edge. Um, and then in addition, we obviously want to snow top these. It's very unlikely that we have so much snow deposited and yet it's managed to not be on top of a lot of the gamers grass tufts. So what we're going to do now is just strategically go in and apply a little bit more material here and there. So what I'm going to do first and foremost, um, and in addition to that, we're also going to add a soft flake snow layer to add a little bit of a transition. And as well, we're going to add a little bit of snow effect uh, over the water here just to, uh, you know, add a little bit of uh, snow that's perhaps kind of blown or, or uh, settled on top of the ice. So what we want to do is, as I said, just grab a little bit of our, our material here, um, just grabbing a little bit on the end of my brush and I'm just going to go in and start looking around so there's a little pock mark here in the ice that I uh, that you know the water effect is just sort of settled out um, and made a little bit of a hole so I'm just going to go ahead and push a little bit of snow um, in and sort of trail it out around that um, in addition here around the rocks um, I have a little bit of ice effect so Although I'm going to put uh, some blown snow on top of the uh, rocks, I'm just going to go ahead and just start laying in a few more uh, deposits on top. So again, just, just sort of piling that up and, and moving it around a little bit. And I don't have to do uh, a lot. You know, it looked pretty good in first, uh, first run through. Just going to go ahead and push that down a little bit. And you can see the snow um, does have a, a little bit more of a, of a deeper white color. It's not as um, sort of uh, bright as it went down, but I actually like this here because it settles out and it has a nice wet sheen to it. It's a little bit maybe tough to pick up on camera, but it definitely looks more like, uh, like a snow deposit. I'm just gonna go ahead and pile that up a little bit. I don't wanna cover all, all, the, uh, all the stone. And again, I'm, I'm not opposed to sort of back brushing and taking a little bit off uh, here and there. Um, these other areas that don't have any snow, we're going to cover over those. I don't really like the full exposed stone. I will have a little bit of that, but we're going to cover that over um, with a little bit of uh, with a little bit of the soft lake directly. Uh, the rock over here, where, where Captain Morgan has stepped up there, I'm just going to just going to dust the, the top of that stone and put a little bit more piled snow. This snow also serves very well to uh, sort of adhere your uh, your feet. Uh, you'll notice that uh, these guys were, were not glued to bases. And so as a result, um, there's not a lot of adherence or contact. Uh, so I'm able to use the, uh, the scenery um, to kind of help me out with that. I also like to take a little bit of the material and brush it just on the bottom portion of the, uh, of the droid's legs here. Um, I'm just going to rotate that around a little bit. This just um, adds to the effect of them sort of trudging through, um, you know, deeper snow. Just kind of go up to like almost like mid mid thigh. They likely would have that uh, build up uh, on their uh, on their legs. I just think it adds to the to the general um, feel and look of this. You know, filling in the joints of this um, this droid who's who's down. You know covering over, trying to leave his eye exposed, but, you know, really, uh, really mixing him into the, uh, to this, to the surroundings, add a little bit more stuff on his chest. And all you have to do is just, you just basically stretch it out, um, from, from your brush. And so it's going to, it's going to pile up, um, where it wants to, it's going to give a nice wet effect. It's also going to create a little bit of, of sheen, um, on, on your stones and, and on your droids legs and that's really the effect we're looking for so again it's not a there wasn't a lot of work to do there um, just a little bit that we wanted to uh, to take care of I'm gonna fill in this little bubble here 
as well, just add a little bit of uh, more sheen to it. Okay, so that, uh, that that's one way of just sort of adding a little bit more after your first layer. Another thing that I like to do is I don't want to dust every single top of the tufts just with the soft lake snow. Some of them I'm actually going to go in and I want to lay a little bit of a physical deposit of snow on top of them. And again, I don't want to do this to every one of them. Um, I just want to have a few of them that are going to have a little bit more of a buildup. So I'm going to go ahead and just do that now, just coming in and, and topping off a few of these, these fall tufts here. And again, I can vary up the amount. Doesn't have to be a doesn't have to be a super large deposit on all of them. Some of them I may want to do a bit more than others. Maybe this one here. It's got a little bit of an exposed edge, so I'm gonna pack it in on this end and then fill a little bit on the top. It just gives a it just gives a little bit of variety and variation um, to the uh, to the tufts and uh, really blends them in uh, a little bit nicer. It's not a far stretch to think that, uh, you know, snow would, would accumulate uh, a little bit disproportionately on, on, certain, uh, on certain tufts in certain areas. And again, you can see what I'm doing. I'm just pushing, pushing it in and then moving it around. I don't really have to, I can dust the tops, that's one method. Um, I can uh, just sort of leave a, a conglomeration and you can see in here, you know, what that what that looks like. Now, we'll certainly add a dusting effect to the others, but I wanted to get some of those piles in there. I'm gonna stay away from the spiky tufts just because they're already uh, quite delicate and fragile. And uh, the other winter tufts are quite wispy. And so they don't have, um, they're a little bit too difficult to pile the snow. Uh, so they'll be much better uh, with the, with just the buildup. Uh, with the with the soft lake snow rather. Um, there's just a little bit of an exposed edge here for the tough, so I'm gonna go in and just blend that out, just having a look. You really just wanna make sure that you have no, there's another one there, you don't wanna have any of the, the tuft edges visible. I mean, that just detracts from the, uh, the natural look that we're trying to achieve here. So you can see I'm just rotating it around, just checking, make sure that the exposed edges are, are covered over blending in the snow. Snow doesn't really, I mean, it starts to look pretty natural, pretty fast. Um, there's no special skill here. You just, you know, you just have to have a, a sort of a sense of what you're trying to achieve, what look you're, you're kind of going for. So so now once that's done, we're, we're pretty set on, in terms of uh, the material. It's, it's not uh, moving, I'd let this dry overnight. Um, a lot of dry time on this particular build, um, so that's just something to take into account. But if you're working on a, a series, because you can apply this the same technique to um, bases of, of actual figures, which which I've done, um, and and they sort of blend in. Actually, let me let me grab those. So here's uh, actual droid bases that I've done in a, in a very similar fashion. So you can see that they they marry up and match up and, and really maintain that scheme across. You're working with a little bit smaller of a palette, obviously, uh, with those, but the same principles apply, the same techniques apply. Um, you can see here the, the snow effect, um, the piling of the snow here on these stones, um, and then a little bit of the dusting, which we're going to do. Um, the dusting is important because what it's going to do is it's going to retexturize uh, anywhere uh, where the snow has uh, necessarily slumped a little bit more than you might like. Um, so you don't have to put the dusting everywhere. So if you want it to be very wispy and windblown and perhaps not an accumulation of granite uh, of granules, then you don't need to really worry about uh, applying this next step. However, in the transition areas or anywhere you'd like to add a little bit of granulation to your snow, um, this is certainly, this next step is certainly going to be important. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a pipette. Uh, you can use something similar. Uh, you can also just brush this on. I just try to avoid uh, brushing too much um, just because I don't really like to use a lot of brushes um, on scenery if I can avoid it. But now that I have my scenic cement here pipette in, um, I'm gonna start going over and I'm literally going to now drizzle and drip this over the entirety uh, of the snow area. This is gonna do three main things for you. One, it's going to lock in your snow even more. 
It's going to give you a foundation for attaching your soft flake snow, which we're going to do here in a minute. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate primarily on the snow that I deposited in the large conglomeration. The reason I'm doing this in, in sequences is because it's a little difficult to see where you've put um, the scenic cement. And when you're laying your soft flake snow down, it's going to be a little bit harder to, um, to see it. So if you know exactly where you're laying it over, um, then it's less important that you know um, where the cement's down. So I'm going to focus on three, three per, uh, main areas. First, I'm going to do the large conglomeration, then I'm going to do the transitions, and then I'm going to do the tufts. Um, but I mentioned three things that this is doing. It's one, it's solidifying and locking in what you've already put down, just that insurance policy. Um, two, it's going to give you a base for the soft flake snow to stick almost instantaneously. And then it's going to actually wick up. And then three, it's actually going to add a little bit more sheen and shine to some areas. Um, and it's really going to give that wet effect in areas that you don't have a large accumulation of snow. So I'm just going to take a little bit of this and decant it here into the lid. And again, you don't need a lot of this. Uh, and I would go very sparingly with this. I like to use the sprinkle technique. And so what I'm doing is I'm just going to go right back over anywhere that I have applied the... I'm going to be in the way of the overhead cam here with my head, but it's okay. Anywhere that I've applied the scenic cement, I actually want to have a little bit more um, accumulation of granule because I want it to have it look like it's a, it's a very fresh fall snow. And so for me, you know, I want to fill in some of those footprints. I want to, I want to, I want to put some granulation uh, down. Now, not necessary, but what I like to do is I do like to come in and I do like to do a second layer. I like to do this because I really want to lock in the snow that I just put down. Now you're going to see what I'm going to do here in a second. I'm going to lock this in and then I'm going to quickly come back with about a quarter of the amount that I already put down. And again, just drips and you can see this stuff wicks through what you just put down. It, it moves really, really fluidly. So now that's down. Now I'm going to come back in with just a teeny, teeny bit just to top off any of those spots. So this is a, this is a buildup. You're building this up just like snowfall would occur. You'd have an accumulation. You'd have some slumping. You know, that sort of settles out. It melts. Then you have a little bit of fresh snowfall and then maybe that you know snowfall occurred you know maybe several hours apart so you're going to have some it's going to be a little bit flatter and then you're going to have some that's going to be real real fresh so there we go so that is the accumulated parts now what we're going to do is go in and start hitting the transitions so for the transitions on the water i'm not going to hit the entire um, area. I'm going to do a little bit on the peripheries, so underneath the legs there, a little bit here in the stones. So drizzle down a little bit, a little bit there, here and there, all over. Okay, I am going to take my brush, get my snow off here, a couple things that I need to do is I want to create a little bit of a, a dusting over the, the um, water area. I want to tamp off a little bit off the rocks. Go. Okay. And now I'm going to come in with that uh, layer of snow. First, I'm going to concentrate on the transitions. Again, just accumulate a little bit in certain spots and then feather it out. So that initial deposit is you kind of like calibrate your fingers like how much am I letting out that's okay to have that deposit and then you really want to feather out the rest you know, the edges here and there don't have to cover in not all of it for sure okay. right now I'm gonna go over the this dust over just a little bit over the water feature
come in a little bit more with the scenic cement just to lock that in just a little bit and it will wick nicely for you so you don't have to worry too much about spreading it out um, that looks good I think okay so that's there and again you see I didn't cover a lot of that water feature I'm leaving it exposed I don't want to I have it, I piled the snow around for a significant reason. It's to create that sort of, that wind blown, that accumulation, that drift that might occur. Um, so all that's quite important to, to have in there for my narrative anyway. All right, last and not least, now we're gonna go and touch the tufts. So again, I can touch the ones that I have um, applied uh, the accumulation on. And I just basically sort of stick the um, pipette sort of right down in the tufts and then give it a little bit of a flood. It will it will back flood the, uh, the tuft out. And then uh, maybe just lift it up and you pretty much, oh, I see a little piece right there that I probably want to maybe add a little bit of snow effect to. Just a little bit of an exposed edge on the tuft here. It's really important, just kind of, you know, as you move around and you look at your piece from different angles, you will see lots of things. You're like, oh, I wish I had a tuft there, or I wish I would have done that. Don't be afraid to go back and add in things that you think you missed. I mean, there's no, there's no stage that you can't go back to um, in this particular uh, process. I mean, you probably can't go back and add like, paints or things like that but um you know what i mean in, in this in this progressive step here you can certainly um backfill with some snow so i'm just going to go and touch that space up all right so now what i'm going to do is hit those tufts and again the sprinkle over the top i will not secondary coat these so basically what sticks is what sticks but at this point you know some of the areas have gotten four dustings And they're, they're really starting to, to have that winter look, winter wonderland look. My apologies, I'm a little farther away from the mic. It's a little tough too. I have to work, I, I work really, really close to my pieces. And I think that's a really important uh, thing for people to, uh, to consider is to get right down into your work, be immersed in it. Um, the best way to achieve a natural look is to be really, really close to your subject. It, I mean, personal preference, I guess, but. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I feel like we, we've achieved the, the winterization uh, look that we're going for. Um, I'll bring it back in, um, in, a final, in some final shots. Uh, we'll put the model on there just to give you a sense of what that looks like. Um, I'm going to throw a little bit more snow accumulation down in the bottom. And a matter of fact, I'm going to pile a little bit up in there. It's just really, um, it's an irrelevant point in terms of the final product, but um, I just feel like if we were able to uh, maybe make that hole uh, for the model base look a little bit more uh, appealing, it would, uh, it would lend to the overall look a little bit nicer here. So. We'll just stack some snow in there. Like so I'll let it dry. It's just going to it's just gonna be an illusionary effect. Get rid of the dusting for complete sake, and then we'll add a little bit of scenic cement in there. Just to give it that wet look. There we go. Okay, so yeah, let's call that finished. Hopefully you guys uh you know, enjoyed uh, at least some of the uh, the steps and you can find some applicable applications for you um, as you move forward. Um, we've definitely transformed a, a relatively bland um, model base into, into something um, that's a little bit more interesting, certainly tells a story, you got a little bit of a appeal there um, going on. For me, it, it just sort of marries up to, uh, you know, the existing units that I already had and just kind of creates and carries that narrative across. Um, the theme of the army we talk about themes uh in terrain as well as model making and painting of course 
and this is no uh, no different. I do like how the grays really play off each other and the yellows are a nice splash in there. So certainly you can mix up the colors if you wanted to have more of a spring look, maybe you have a bit more greens, those maybe olives start to come in. If you wanted to go more of a fall look, perhaps you have some of the dark greens and you and you drop your accumulation of snow down a little bit um, uh, or, or a significant amount. If you want to have a kind of a spring melt even, um, a little bit more wet effects would be appropriate, maybe uh, less ice and more water starting to uh, accumulate there or a combination of the both of both of those. So just pay attention to the particular biome that you're going for, but these techniques, uh, in, at least in terms of snow application, will be applicable regardless of how much you're doing. So um, till next time, guys, thanks for watching. Appreciate you patrons. Um, as always, any suggestions or things that you'd like to see in the future, uh, please let me know, open to suggestions, looking to really grow the Patreon and you guys are the way to do it. So uh, till next time, thanks for watching. Cheers.